Welcome back to episode 8 of Well and Retold Behind the Session. So, this one has quite a few exciting things in there, as I'm sure you've been able to see already. Uh, please, of course, go and watch the actual 8th episode of Well and Retold if you're watching this first for some reason. Um, as to avoid spoilers, because we're going to jump right into it. Firstly, uh, Andrew Linnell. <laughs> Uh, made a very quick and easy demise very early into this episode, um, which was certainly interesting for me, for as I've said, I once envisioned from the beginning in the third episode, which ironically by the end of this episode we know now that uh, <laughs> there's a special reference to the fact that episode 3 is coming up in conversation this early. But I originally thought when I introduced Reese. I probably, and it feels silly now, but I probably would have hedged my bets on believing that the party and, well, everyone at the table would have agreed it would have been best to go against Reese because he was an obvious threat to them and end up teaming up and working with the president, Andrew Linnell. Um, that didn't shake out. <laughs> and I'm glad it didn't. I think it's a lot more fun to play with... Uh, an ally like um, Doris for as long as they did, unto, of course, in this very episode, um, largely helped by Zook of all people, uh, they somewhat tarnish that alliance that they've been uh, able to maintain for this long. But Andrew Linnell is quickly dispatched of when the party and their sort of... Um, cascade of fuck-ups, for lack of a better word, um, or phrase... <laughs> does lead them to uh, really piss off the centres very directly, um, and it is kind of forcing Doris and his men into a corner of like, oh well shit, you're connected to us, they're going to track you back to us now, we have to push the advantage while you've got them disorganised um, from your escape, or we will be the ones to bite the bullet. It's very clear that for a long time Teresa has been putting off and trying to avoid a direct and open confrontation with the centaurs until he feels he's stockpiled an extremely high amount of wealth, power, and etc. Um, which paid off, and as he quickly learned, which is quite interesting, because I've known this for a while as a DM, I'm well aware that Doris was being overly cautious, not that he fully appreciated that, um, because I was well aware the centaurs were not nearly as well equipped as Doris was assuming worst case scenario. He wasn't going to risk putting his men or, or innocent people in the streets into danger until he was certain that he would be able to um, have a swift and uh, uh, decisive victory against the centaurs with as little casualties as possible. Um, so, cut to, as you saw, uh, him unleashing his full dragon form with the help of a scroll to polymorph him for an hour. Um, able to dispatch of the leader extraordinarily easily to his own surprise, and then, of course, with all his men and the powered-out party, all the way to level 20 now, were able to very easily dispatch of uh, any remaining forces resistance in the uh, Centaur military. Um, and that has obviously, as we can see later in this episode, given uh, Doris some thoughts about the fact that it was this easy to do, and he was actually far more powerful than them already. Um, so, I won't say too much about that, because of course there's more to come, but essentially it's pretty obvious now as Dreese is looking to take over and have claimed a rulership of the city of Dale, one of the three major cities of Woolen, which is a considerable amount of power to take in, you know, in an hour. Um, of course, that doesn't discount the fact that he spent, you know, years of building up, preparing, and doing a lot of things, and retcon, and spying, and everything to kind of get into the position he's in now, where he can so easily take it. But, all that aside, um, the next focus we should uh, uh, look to talk about instead of focusing on Doris, because, of course, we can learn more about his uh, his intentions behind what he'll do, and what he has such amount of power and a foothold in the actual island of Wallen, um, which we'll get to is to focus more on that level 20 thing. Isn't that crazy? I... Don't worry. Uh, while this is my first time doing a campaign and being a DM, I am well aware... <coughs> trust me, I'm well aware how, how many experienced DMs out there were, like, screaming at their screens at the idea that I allowed... I believe at the time, level 7 characters to use a wish scroll and just wish to be max power and become level 20 just like that. 
Uh, I'm well aware that is not how it's supposed to work. That does not work with the rules. That is extremely broken um, in the most extreme way you could possibly imagine, of course. And I knew all that before I allowed it to happen. And I was the one who encouraged. I I was all for um, them being able to uh, immediately just cheat their way to level 20. Because what I am doing, I think I've mentioned this a little bit before, and now around this part of the story, we start to see what I mean to the most extremes of it, is that what I've referenced is how I am, <clears throat> I use this first campaign of Wallen, uh, the Wallen campaign, to stress test everything, since this is my first time a game, everything is going on, I don't intend for it to be like the longest campaign ever, as mentioned previous times, there's 15 episodes and then an epilogue, uh, so we are drawing closer and closer to the end now, um, but... I wanted to stress test a lot of things that I thought would be really interesting, exciting, just cool ideas that you couldn't really do in most forms of media, fiction, and stories without ruining it, um, or even just most campaigns. And I was well aware I would almost certainly not do any of these sorts of, like, big, bold, risky, um, whatever the word is, just not moves, but allowing these massive things to happen, uh, such as, uh, allowing wishes to literally have no limits and you can actually wish for anything as well as allowing things like time travel to be commonly used um uh, as seen when Doris was easily able to use his wish girl to literally wish to go back in time at the end of this episode uh and succeeds in doing so and it actually does pull them back in time it's not a cheap trick where uh, like in, you know, your typical superhero movie where, or an episode of TV where it's like, oh no, they've been sent back in time, this is going to change everything forever. And then because, of course, they want to maintain an ongoing story arc, characters, things, and blah, 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 um, they don't actually let you go through with such a satisfying, interesting new turn up to the story. And the, in, the, in the most shows and whatever else you see in stories and books, they will allow you to feel that fear of like, oh, we've been trapped in a whole new place and it changes everything. And then they find some way throughout the next episode or the next chapter to, while well, work very hard and maybe make a sacrifice or two, able to get back to their timeline and prevent that from going wrong. Um, and of course, there's a very sensible and good reason why you should do that when trying to maintain a good story most of the time. But in this case, that did not happen. There was no railroading whatsoever. I allowed complete and open freedom in this sandbox campaign, as I promised my players from the start. And that for that reason, um, I can assure you, starting next episode they will not be somehow quickly finding a way to jump back to where they are in time they have been sent back to episode three and they will be staying there they will have to go through not necessarily repeat their exact steps they obviously will use the knowledge of what's happened before to change their actions and change where they go and what they do but it's not going to be uh, an easy fix. And I think that's exciting. I think that makes the story much more interesting when it's not just going to have an easy cop-out. Oh, never mind, everything's okay after all because we didn't want to have any like lasting permanent effects in the story. Uh, yeah, I don't do any of that in this campaign whatsoever. Um, I can appreciate the need to do it in future ones, but definitely not this one. Uh, and so for that reason, allowing for time travelling, allowing for like infinite wishes that could literally wish the BBEG to not exist in the first place, things like that, totally allowed which i'm well aware is crazy and could seriously break the game and i wanted to see how far we could push that just so i knew when i would need to pull back the idea of doing this at this point was so that future campaigns i'd ever run and more things i might do with these stories and characters in the future um i knew what lines to draw clearly it's pretty obvious to anyone but you probably should allow your players in your world to be able just to wish for absolutely anything without any limits or allow them just to time travel and go back and change everything that's happened because that's obviously pretty insane. But I wanted to test it for myself. I wanted to see what they would actually do when allowed power that essentially any form of story no one ever allows uh, their characters to do, usually for very good reason. Um, and... I look forward to you all being able to see what exactly I got to learn um, from allowing such things. Um, but then being level 20 was going to be a fun and interesting thing, I thought, especially when you take into account the fact that at level 20, um, you know, you have two perspectives. One is, well, they're already max level, they've already done all their progress, there's nothing forward to look forward to for them for the sake of like doing combat or frills. So therefore, 
what's the fun? What's the fun of playing the rest of a whole story campaign uh, at level 20? Um, which is a, uh, is, a, is a fair question, but I was personally never bothered by that question um, because I like to think of it more if I let them just go straight to level 20. I like to imagine, as a person who's never even played it once in my life, but I know enough from just word of mouth to understand what I'm saying now is almost certainly true, uh, is that I believe in World of Warcraft, you, uh, I think, I think max level was 80, uh, but regardless of whether it is or not, once you get to whatever that max level is, and you're essentially, in, I don't know if it's considered in game or not, but I understand that a lot of the content of the game, in fact maybe the majority of it, uh, I'm assuming, actually opens up once you are max level. And that's when you can start taking on some really big and complex and difficult um, enemies or whatever else. And things, um, yeah, there's a lot more options available to you when you are at max level. I think maybe you get like a flying mount at max level or something so you can fly across the world. I, I'm, I'm purely speculating. <laughs> of course, most people listening to this will probably know a lot better than I will. But <laughs> all to say... There is a valid argument just from that standpoint that when you get to max level and you are very, very, very powerful and now you can face the biggest foes um, in the world, that doesn't mean necessarily that the story is going to be boring. I think you could have a lot of fun and do a lot of interesting things with level 20 characters. Now that said, because of the choices they make and the things that they do, they end up within this episode, by the time they get sent back in time to session 3 from uh, trying to betray Dries, that they do lose that. And I do end up taking that level 20 away from them, but it wasn't my intention to. I was very prepared and happy to have them go all the way through it. I did not think they would actually decide to try and betray Dries uh, so quickly after succeeding in helping him take the city. Um... And thus, as they understood, of course, they weren't too upset about it. They recognised that the choices they made may not have been the wisest ones in hindsight, and it did cost them their massive power-up. All that to say, um, uh, the deck of many things is also something very, very powerful and interesting to uh, explore as well, because I wanted, just like for the wish spell, I wanted the deck of many things to feel like a truly powerful artefact. Something that is... Uh, when I read about the Deck of Many Things, when I understood what it was prior to uh, fully engaging in the game to its full extent, I knew immediately um, that obviously the Deck of Many Things is a very powerful and revered object, you know, legendary for a reason, it is, is, is a hell of an artifact. But I wanted to go further with it, and I wanted to make sure... Because in some campaigns, because of how the rules are, if you, like, the idea of these amazing, powerful, you know, potentially world-changing effects when you draw a card can be so cool and awesome. Uh, and I do love, I love that. That's a good thing about it. It's a shame that sometimes, if you find, some of the cards are not actually that... Uh, some, some are certainly a lot more underwhelming compared to the rest. There are some really good heavy hitters that I love. And I just personally wish most of the, well, actually all of the rest of the cards were on the same level as some of the best ones in the deck. So that way every single card, good and bad, 50-50, all have massive effects. So that way when you're drawing a card, you can almost guarantee it is going to have some sort of permanent change on the world around you, not just on you individually. Um... And for that, while it doesn't come up in this campaign, I intentionally did not do anything to stray from the rules, use too much homebrew when I was making the game uh, for this campaign. After this campaign had finished, I did go back and rewrite most of the effects of the Deck of Many Things for me personally. Um, and balance is, is... I suppose balance is not exactly the thing you strive for when you introduce the Deck of Many Things into your campaign, because that ultimately is quite contradictory uh but i have definitely made them all a lot more powerful in terms of effects only some of the extremely strong and insane ones when used properly and you use your imagination to its full extent to really make the most out of those changes only those really powerful cards were not changed the rest of mine were using those as inspirations to become better so you know now uh now you really do need to fear when you draw a bad card. It's not just going to have like a minor debuff to your character. It is uh, properly scary. Everything in there feels like a world-changing, universe-shattering um, effect. Um, and we got to see, at least, without my special custom effects being needed, just by a default effects of one of the cards you can draw that are not ideal, that poor old Palin and his 
well-documented greed and loot goblin behavior that he has trouble resisting the urge to like take the spoils and loots of war um yeah he pretty quickly uh met uh um, a pretty grim and fitting fate for himself when unable to resist the urge to always take more for himself when he can and so as he very cunningly found a way to get himself the ability to purchase and draw a single card luck did not shine upon him as he was very quickly uh, to keep it vague enough he was poofed away and not to be seen again so that's a pretty good lesson in uh in the deck of many things and how um if you fuck around you will find out um <laughs> so uh well he's almost certainly not dead because the deck of many things is very really that merciful um we can't say rest in peace but you know uh yeah rest wherever you are sorry Balan. um but that was right, it worked out very conveniently, um, just by coincidence, that, sure enough, Zook was still in the bloody um, Magical Emporium after Palin was um, vanished away, which meant that it was a pretty smooth transition for uh, Zack, who played Palin, to return to his original character Zook and, and just pick up on him again. Uh, and so that... That, I would say that worked out, but considering where things went, I guess it absolutely didn't. Um, so, obviously, might as well just throw this in here, it's not a big deal, but just while we're talking about everything, it is worth noting that uh, earlier on, after the success of taking down Andrew Linnell, poor old uh, Dane did fail his history check with a natural one, so he pretty badly misunderstood... Uh, or failed to understand the significance of how, <laughs> considering the lore for the world of Written, how horrible, horrible it is that he was riding a centaur. Um, huge no-no in the context of the lore of the world. Um, the centaurs may not exactly be the most wonderful people a lot of the time, um, and especially the ones in positions of power, as we've seen, are can be quite corrupt. Um... But they are the original natives of Wallen, uh, and they certainly have not had a good goal of it in history, uh, especially when the elves many, many, many years ago invaded Wallen and sort of colonised it, and uh, and did a lot to harm the uh, the traditions and the ways of uh, the Centaur people. So, yeah, it's 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 quite it's quite unfortunate. I remember the players at the time were not aware. They couldn't be because, of course, they failed the history check when I gave them one when a Dane showed an interest in wanting to ride a centaur unaware of what that actually meant and the significant weight of it um, essentially being a hate crime. Um, and unfortunately, so they all the players were unaware when he was like, oh, I guess there's nothing wrong because I couldn't give any information on his history check. So he just went ahead and started doing it in front of all the other centaurs. And it's horrible. It's so bad. It is such a hor- I don't want to make a comparison to what that would be like in real life with the same sort of, like, offensive nature to it, but it is- it's pretty gnarly. And, uh, I just remember being the, the only person at the table there who was just cringing the entire time because I never fully understood the context behind the lore I had written for the centaur people and their, and their, their very, very dark history. Oh boy. Yeah, so uh, Dane definitely not his not his best moment, but back to <laughs> less uncomfortable conversations. Um, we then, of course, had Zook back in the party. Uh, very lucky too, considering all the shenanigans and tomfoolery that he has been up to. Uh, and then, of course, he immediately like the little parasite that he is uh <laughs> i love i love the character but my god does he cause problems and yes uh the wonderful zook did immediately decide for himself like yep i think it's all well and fine i think it's a good idea i think i'll just go right ahead and uh convince the party to betray Doris for his own personal gain as we quickly realize after the fact unfortunately the two other players did not catch on as quickly um 
uh, as, as you would hope they would, in time to stop Zook from doing his bullshit. And sure enough, they have the power to kill and betray Doris, and they do so, but not before Zook can get out what he wants from it, and manages to escape on his own without any way to be followed or tracked down, um, have access to a huge amount of power with uh, the entire Warhammer on his back to allow him to teleport and go at will with the strength from the belt and not be strong enough to like, crush the heads of an individual person, but to be able to wield the hammer itself and uh, and just wreak devastation. And that's not even accounting for what sort of spells and stuff he'd be capable of casting. Um, so it seems fate has essentially decided one way or the other, Zok always finds a way to be a massive problem. And, of course, it was very, very interesting, knowing full well at the time, by the time he did the betray, take the items from Doris and teleport to Green Tully and start to plan, you know, his world, his, his, you know, his plans for world domination. Um, it was already, uh established at that point because Teresa had already made the wish that this would not be able to continue. So I knew there was going to be like no long-term uh, consequence for Zook being able to get away and start considering what he's going to do to you know, do, do horrible things to unleash upon the world. But it was fun to watch the players who were not aware immediately that uh, they had actually been put into Teresa's trap to ensure this does not um, uh, continue to unravel and go out of control. It was fun to watch um, Zack playing Zook at the time as he considered what exactly he was going to get his character to um, do with all this power, felt that the limit of the party to hold them back or slow them down uh, where he wanted to go. And I think it would have been very interesting to watch if he, uh, once Zook believed he had enough power, he had a lot already, but he'd probably figure it'd be good for him to get like some men behind him, get an army if he can, and rally like a whole bunch of power and force, and once he could, then he uh, would probably want to, with as much protection as he does, because he well we it would be uh, not an easy thing to do, I imagine Zook would be quite keen to raid and try to seize control of the entire magical emporium, make use of all the items, and become essentially the closest one can become to being a god, um, without actually just being one. <laughs> and so... That would certainly, I always thought, be a very interesting um, uh, route to go down, to watch Zook kind of, watch Zook unleashed and watch what he is capable of doing when he essentially stops, thinks about it, tries to make a clever and well thought out plan. Because he is intelligent, he just usually gets his uh, impulses and emotions to get the better of him. Uh, he is a wizard, he's got a very high intelligence stat, and so... If he tries, it'd be very fun to watch what happens if he were to attempt to um, amass a mass amount of power and then lead whatever he can bring with him and all the items and power that he has at his fingertips and try to overtake the Magical Emporium by force. That would be a hell of, a, hell of an interesting uh, uh, story to watch play out. And uh, I certainly feel... Um, intrigued to see that play out in the future <clears throat> for children um but for the time being naturally he doesn't get to get that far he doesn't get to get started on that big plan because of course Doris uh accounted for this and was quickly dispatched um sorry if you can hear the dogs barking i'm sure there's a leaf outside that was uh causing problems and um after being able to deal with uh What's it called? Um, uh, Doris, um, Dane and Adar, of course, killing him and feeling pretty bad about it at this point, realizing they definitely chose the wrong side of that situation. Um, quickly, all find themselves back in the Doppelganger Tavern in session three, with Zook there by himself, and everything's been reset, and it is one hell of an interesting cliffhanger plot twist and very, very scary situation um, for the entire party. And it's quite exciting to uh, just to imagine uh, what they're going to do now, <laughs> especially now that Doris still has all the power and knowledge that he does, while the poor uh, party only have the knowledge of what happens. Without like, all their power, without a means to reobtain the um, the level 20 status 
that Palin, before his uh, departure, was able to obtain for them, they are now forced to a situation where it looks very grim for them. And as Therese put best, they better start running. I think as far as it goes, that essentially wraps up everything that I have to say about uh, this session in particular. Obviously there's a lot to look forward to going forth now that um, the tables have most certainly been turned. And I suppose I'll be seeing you all next time if you're willing to tune back in after next month's episode of session 9 comes out and you're back here to hear the behind the sessions uh in which case i am sure we'll have a little bit more to talk about as things most certainly will have uh been shaken up quite a bit thank you guys and i'll see you next time